This is a mechanism of disease map for ulcerative colitis. I'll be talking about the etiology of ulcerative colitis, as well as the pathophysiology mechanisms that lead into the manifestations of the disease. I've also made a flowchart like this for Crohn's disease, and it's worth looking at both of these together. They have some um, important similarities and some differences that are worth knowing that can help you differentiate between the two conditions. As with all of these maps, they are color-coded according to the core concepts listed in this legend up here. And if you want to take a, a screenshot, do that now. I'll otherwise be talking about all of these uh, little bubbles one by one. So first, let's talk about the etiology of ulcerative colitis. There's, you can have a genetic predisposition to UC, to ulcerative colitis. The actual genes and sequences aren't worth knowing. Um, they're still yet to be elucidated, but it is worth knowing that you can have an HLA B27 association with ulcerative colitis. There's also a racial ethnic component. White people and Ashkenazi Jewish people tend to have ulcerative colitis. It's much less frequently seen in other races and ethnicities. In many cases, up to 20%, people with UC have a family history of the disease. So that kind of further evidences this genetic, hereditary, racial, ethnic predisposition for UC. There are some drugs like NSAIDs and uh, oral contraceptives that can predispose you to having ulcerative colitis. And it's been found that people who eat um, a lot of saturated fats or animal fats tend to get ulcerative colitis. So that can either um, originate your ulcerative colitis, that can start you from having it, it could also cause flare-ups. So um, that's another predisposing etiology, another predisposing factor. There's also a couple predictive factors that are worth knowing for ulcerative colitis. If you have an appendectomy, you're less likely to have UC. And in older years of medicine, they used to do an appendectomy as a treatment for ulcerative colitis. It's also interesting that smoking has a protective effect on ulcerative colitis. This is in contrast to Crohn's disease, where smoking tobacco exacerbates Crohn's disease. Now, of course, just because smoking has a protective effect doesn't mean that smoking is recommended in any way to treat ulcerative colitis. Smoking is not recommended, and uh, it's just been found to have a protective effect, um, an alleviating effect on symptoms for patients who have UC. Now let's talk about the main pathophysiology of ulcerative colitis. It's twofold, and these two kind of interact with each other. There's dysregulation of the intestinal epithelium, and there's also dysregulation of the immune system. So first, on the epithelial side, you'll have increased permeability. This is due to Th17 dysfunction. And you'll have luminal bacteria that enters your body, and it activates macrophages and dendritic cells, which then eat up that luminal bacteria and present the antigens. When you have antigen presentation, this will lead to secretion of more pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and this recruits all kinds of other immune cells, and you'll have a full-on uh, inflammatory response. You can have native CD4 plus cells that differentiate into Th2 effector cells as part of this response, and you'll also have recruitment of NK cells, or natural killer cells. Now, on the immune system dysfunction side, you'll have an increase in lymphatic cells that leads to an increase in immune reaction and cytotoxic effects on the colonic equilibrium. So these two are kind of related. You'll have increased permeability that causes your immune system to go crazy, and when your immune system goes crazy, it'll have a damaging effect on the epithelium. So they kind of create a vicious cycle between the two. In any case, when you have this cytotoxic effect on your colonic equilibrium, you'll have local tissue damage that can include ulcerations, erosions, and necrosis of the bowel wall. And this is typically in the submucosa and mucosal layers of the bowel wall. This is in contrast to Crohn's disease, which has more of a, a full uh, effect on the entire length of the, uh, of the, of the bowel wall. In Crohn's disease, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it affects the full thickness of the bowel wall, as opposed to just the submucosa and the, and the mucosal layers. In addition, you'll have autoantibodies against your intestinal epithelial cells. These are P-ANCA antibodies, and you can actually detect these on blood tests, although that's not typically done for diagnosis. You'll also have a Th2 cell-mediated response. Now next we'll talk about some of the direct effects of this main central mechanism, as well as some of the downstream mechanisms and uh, effects from that. So first, let's talk about histology. 
Early on in the histology, you'll see granulocytes and crypt abscesses. And then later on in the histology, in, in the chronic disease, you'll have lymphocytes, mucosal atrophy, altered crypt architecture, and epithelial dysplasia. On colonoscopy, you'll note that ulcerative colitis always involves the rectum. Again, this is in contrast to Crohn's disease, which typically spares the rectum. Ulcerative colitis is also continuous, and it tends to ascend from the colon. Um, you'll, in early cases, you'll have friable mucosa with bleeding and ulcers, and as the disease progresses, you might see pseudopolyps, strictures, and loss of haustra or mucosal folds. Now let's talk about some more mechanisms that lead to more manifestations of the disease, leading into the signs and symptoms of the disease. In ulcerative colitis, you'll have altered expression and function of epithelial membrane, ion channels, and transporters. This results in decreased water and ion absorption from your gut lumen. And this is what can result in bloody diarrhea. So if you're not absorbing water and ions in your gut, you'll poop those out. And because you have all this damage, these ulcerations, erosions, and necrosis, that poop, that diarrhea will be bloody in this case. Of course, this is all very inflammatory, so the patient will have a fever. You'll also have loss of epithelial tight junctions, and that leads to mucosal cell damage and ulceration. When you have ulcers, you'll have things leak back into the GI lumen. Um, that's antigens, water, and other solutes can all leak back into the GI, and that kind of exacerbates your bloody diarrhea. So not only are you not absorbing stuff from your gut lumen, but you're also losing things into your gut lumen. And both of those cause bloody diarrhea. And as I mentioned, the ulcers themselves are, are what causes the bleeding into your stool. This is of course very painful. Ulcers can be very painful and all of this diarrhea can be painful. So you'll stimulate your visceral and parietal pain receptors, which of course go to the central nervous system and process and the patient will have abdominal pain and cramps. Now these are typically localized to the left lower quadrant. In addition, because you have all of this inflammation going on in the gut, you'll have decreased rectal compliance and a decreased defecation reflex, which can also be very painful and also contribute to the abdominal pain and cramping. This decreased rectal compliance, decreased defecation reflex and pain leads to a sensation called tenismus. Now this is like a, a sensation of unsatisfactory bowel movements. You'll feel like you have to go. You'll feel like there's something um, in your butt and something that, that you need to poo out, but you're not able to get that satisfaction of going. So it's, a, it's like a, a feeling of unsatisfaction after bowel movements or unsatisfaction when you try to have a bowel movement, tenismus. These factors, the abdominal pain, the cramping, the bloody diarrhea can generally lead to food avoidance. Patients will realize that when they eat, they have all these symptoms, they have all this inflammation, they'll feel horrible, so they can present with avoidance or anorexia. And in addition, having all these ulcers and the cellular inflammation in your gut leads to malabsorption. Both the malabsorption and the anorexia can both contribute to weight loss in the patients. And if you're not absorbing your nutrients, the patient's going to be malnourished, which is unfortunate. In addition, they'll have chronic blood loss. Again, these ulcers tend to bleed quite a bit and that blood loss can directly cause anemia. So the patient might, pr might present with fatigue or weakness. Um, in addition, with that malabsorption, that chronic blood loss, the patient can become iron deficient. So that's usually the pattern of anemia that you'll see on blood tests. And I already mentioned that this can cause fatigue and weakness. And of course, being malnourished can contribute to that fatigue as well. This is a systemic problem. So the inflammation might start in the gut, but it can have an effect throughout the body. When you have systemic cytokine release, this can result in decreased EPO production. That's low erythropoietin production. And of course, EPO is what stimulates making more blood cells. So you'll have decreased bone marrow function in ulcerative colitis. And this is another factor that exacerbates the anemia. Not only are you chronically losing blood into your gut, you're also iron deficient and you're malnourished, and you're also making less blood cells. So there's a few hits that affect this anemia. And of course, when you have the systemic inflammatory response, the body is in a hypercatabolic state and it has more metabolic demands. So not only are you malnourished, you're malabsorbing your nutrients, but your body's also working harder because of all this inflammation. And this, of course, can contribute to your fatigue as well. The 
state of being chronically systemically inflamed is generally unpleasant in the central nervous system. And um, this can result in anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and pain. And all of that can also lead to weight loss. That hypercatabolic state, the malabsorption, the malnutrition, and generally being inflamed, in pain, um, avoiding food, all contributes to weight loss. There's a significant cancer risk for ulcerative colitis. It's uh, predominantly colorectal cancer, or cholangiocarcinoma. Those are the ones that are worth knowing. And as I mentioned, because this is a systemic problem, you might have extra intestinal manifestations or manifestations of the disease, of the inflammation outside of the gut. I've listed some of these here. Um, in the skin, you can have erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrenosum, and amphitus stomatitis in the mouth. In the eyes, you can have uveitis, episcleritis, and iritis. In the joints, you can have osteoarthritis ankylosing spondylitis, and sacroiliitis. And you can, there's, a, there's an association between ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now, it's worth knowing the prevalence of both of these diseases together. 90% of patients with PSC, with primary sclerosing cholangitis, have ulcerative colitis. But the opposite is not necessarily true. It's not, uh, it's not that everybody with ulcerative colitis has PSC. It's that nearly everybody with PSC has ulcerative colitis. So it's worth knowing that, that complicated association there. So this has been a mechanism of disease map for ulcerative colitis. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.